the 7-Eleven dunks that could have been. Canadian artist Justin Polson created a miniature masterpiece paying homage to Western Canada and skate culture. This work features a shoebox resembling a 7-Eleven convenience store with a one-of-a-kind Nike dunks inside. Take a look. What has been the most interesting feedback that you've received so far? Overall feedback that I've received from this project has been, it's been overwhelmingly positive and I didn't really expect it to affect so many other people in the way that I was affected by it because it's a convenience store and how much can you relate to that? But I have a lot of people pouring out support and saying that 7-Eleven was a cultural touch point for their community when they were growing up too and they, uh, they really respect the build and the craftsmanship and the time. So I'm really happy with how people have reacted. So I see that you're wearing a green polo right now. Is that a, <laughs> it, it reminds, oh, oh, 7-Eleven uniform right over here. <laughs> did did you wear this on 7-Eleven day? I did, I wore this to my, my local 7-Eleven on 7-Eleven day. Uh, it, it was not received well. It was a little bit of a confusion point for them. They were curious why I was wearing their uniform, <laughs> but uh, it's me showing solidarity with the uh, 7-Eleven workers and appreciating them for serving me my, my precious Slurpees. <laughs> now you have many intricate details down to a T. I've got to ask you, how many screws did it take to make this project? Screws? There the are tiny ones. Oh, the ones in the roof. There are 364. Wow. Think? Somewhere <laughs> around that. Was it was it hard to put them all in? Because those are very, yeah. very tiny, especially it, on a miniature. <laughs> they were they were smaller than anything I've ever tried to pick up. Uh, you had to use tweezers with a magnifying glass on the end. And I was basically just hoping and praying three hundred and whatever times in a row that it was gonna stick in the right place. Uh, it was definitely overkill. But I think when you see the piece up close, you can really respect the craftsmanship. So it was worth it to do it for me. Do you feel like COVID slowed down this project with regard to gathering materials? It slowed down the process incredibly. It was, it was a real process to get some of the supplies during COVID. I had four day waits at Home Depot to pick up stuff on the curbside orders. Uh, just in general, getting all of the supplies was very, very difficult. Everything had to be ordered. And if you didn't make a minimum order size, you had to pay extra. It was it was pretty crazy. Especially probably with the paint too. How were you able to get the exact shade? Because I know you are a perfectionist. You like everything to be exact. So did you have some issues even finding the right shade? Did you have to buy multiple cans of paint just to get it right? Absolutely. I. I I remember searching for the specific green, the 7-Eleven green, and I had to buy seven different shades of it. And I got them back and they were all wrong. They, because you, when you look at the color on the website, it's not exactly the color that you get in person. So I ended up having to get another shade. And I think it was the eighth shade that was correct. But I have a lot of green paint now that I will have to find a use for. This project is so grand and such a true masterpiece. Have you always been this creative even as a child? Can you tell me a bit about the first big project that really set you on your path to artistic success? It could have, it could have involved a dinosaur. Uh <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I, I, I started off my childhood doing a lot of art projects. There were, started drawing at a very early age and it just kind of elevated from there. Uh, there was, one time I remember in my second grade class, the second grade art class, we had to make paper mache dinosaurs and they requested them to be realistic. And I specifically took this as being, oh, they needed to be realistic as in life scale. 
And so I came home that day and I told my mom, hey, we need to make a realistic dinosaur and it needs to be life size and it needs to be made out of paper mache. And she's like, that can't be right. And I said, oh, it's right. This is what we need to do and this is how we're going to do it. And she's like, okay. And she helped me find out the, the dinosaur that we had to make that would be realistic in the scale. And we ended up making a, tr tr uh, we ended up making a pterodactyl that was four and a half feet in wingspan. So yeah, it was massive. And I think having that, uh, that support from my parents really helped. There's lots of small items that come together to give this work such depth and such, uh, such as the dumpster, the telephone, the garbage can. What was your favorite item to work on for this project? I really enjoyed making the dumpster. Uh, it was probably the quickest build out of the entire thing. And it's, it's just really rewarding and easy because you can make them pretty fast. I think the other parts like the phone and uh, the small garbage cans, they're very difficult to make. So it was a little bit of a longer process, but still very rewarding to see them, knowing that probably no one has ever made something similar to that. How many 7-Elevens did you have to visit to make this project look so realistic and authentic? Uh, <laughs> probably visited about six or seven. I have about four that I took a lot of inspiration from. And uh, I, I think about them often when I, when I was making this. Were there any items that you had to use many layers of paint to create a certain aesthetic? Everything was heavily painted. Everything had multiple, multiple layers of paint into it. The brickwork took maybe seven or, seven or eight different colors. Uh, and then I also took oil paint on top in, uh, in a low opacity and just had washes that would uh, cover it and make it look as if rain had w worn on the brick over time. This project looks so lifelike. Do some people think it may be computer generated? I often get asked what renderer did I use or what program did I use to make the CGI? And I have to respond that I used my hands because it's all very much handmade, handcrafted. and. Uh, that's what I do. I've dabbled in CGI before and I have a lot of respect for it, but this is very much, it, this entire project, I knew that it had to be hand done. Uh, it was just so near and dear to my heart, so. Can you tell me about the 7-Eleven shoe that Nike later came out with? So about halfway through this entire project, I got an alert on my phone and it said that Nike and 7-Eleven were going to be releasing an actual Nike 7-Eleven shoe. And I was a bit freaked out because it felt like someone was watching me at first because this would, I had been planning this for multiple years. I, I had had this shoe for about two years at that point. And so that happened. And then about a week later, there was a new alert that said that the shoe was canceled and that because of the Japan Olympics being de delayed, they decided to delay or uh, cancel the shoe. And so, it canceled and I decided to go on with my project and show what they could have done if they had committed. Do you think you will continue to make more miniatures as this project has been so successful? I think that I'd like to do some miniature work, but I'd also like to see what else is out there. Maybe I'll go large scale next time. Maybe I'll make something that's larger than life. What has been the hardest part of this piece for you to make? I had multiple difficult uh, parts to this project. One of which being the doors, of course. The doors broke multiple times, like two weeks of doors just breaking and code going wrong. And it was just a mess, but I, we, we got through that. And then there was uh, the soffits, the, the parts that are underneath the roof that are just kind of like the paneling that uh, protect the roof. Those had to be laser cut and the software literally didn't want to run the code because it was so intense. It just froze up every time and I had to talk to the manufacturer and see, we had to find a workaround that could make the laser cutter go. So that was difficult. How many hours from start to finish did it take you to complete this project? Really tough to say. Uh, I didn't keep track because it was, took so long, but I know that it would probably take between four and six months 
full time if I had to do it again. You are a perfectionist. So for you, when did you know it was time to stop the project? It's really tough. It's really tough to know when you're done, when you have no real deadline. So I gave myself the self uh, instated deadline of July 11th, 7-11 day. And that was when I was done. I had to just work so hard for the remaining two months and then release it on 7-11 day. You've completed a project that most people wouldn't have the first clue how to start. The detail is amazing and the concept is mind blowing. What inspired this piece? I think it was just inspired by my general interests and in trying to take all of the interests that I have and combine them into one project to really encapsulate what I'm passionate about and try and do something that no one would think to do. What was the first thing that you decided to make for the shoebox aspect? Because there's so much going on. The first thing is the walls. You, you got to put the walls up. Uh, so those were laser cut out of MDF wood. And then uh, from there, you build it out and you start to flesh it out. You start to add things to it like signage and doors. And then you try and make the doors move. And then you try and make a lid that articulates so you can open it up and show off the shoes. And you just keep on adding stuff until it looks like a real 7-Eleven basically. You were raised in Alberta. Can you tell me a bit about the frozen drink culture in Central and Western Canada? It's huge. It's uh, it's everything. I know that Winnipeg is the uh, capital of Slurpees and it's the same in Alberta. Uh, if you're from rural Alberta, 7-Eleven becomes a cultural touch point for us. It becomes a meeting place, uh, a place that we go to to meet other people and to enjoy these beverages. How often do you purchase a 7-Eleven Slurpee? I probably have one once a day, uh, at least. <laughs> I'm trying to cut down. <laughs> There's so much to take in and such a short amount of time for this project. Would you be able to share any Easter eggs? I think my favorite things might be the that the garbage cans have little cigarette butts on the tops of them, just as they do. They have the ashes. Um, they also have uh, bird poop on top of the signs and the building itself because it's natural. It's what happens at a 7-Eleven parking lot. <laughs> In this video before the shoe box opens, you can see uh, some dark shadows entering the frame. Can you tell me what the idea behind that was uh, to make it feel so eerie? I just wanted a surreal foreshadowing of what was to come uh, and to kind of give you an idea that something, something big was coming and that thing ends up being a regular size. It ends up being the size of a person. And so it throws your view of the entire project uh, into a different realm. You now know that this is actually very small and the person is very large. The shoe in the videos are customized Nike Dunks. Would you be able to get the same pair online today on the Nike website? Unfortunately, no longer are you able to customize a Nike Dunk on the Nike website, they've become really popular and hyped up in the past couple of years. So they removed them from the website and now you can only uh, customize other other shoes. What made you think to do the dunks though? Because you could have picked any other shoe and you chose the dunks and you decided to alter it a certain way. You decide to do some embroidery on it. Why that shoe and why those? Why that whole color scheme? I know because they're the 7-Eleven colors, but why specifically in certain places and the embroidery? I think I saw something that I wanted from the market that didn't exist. I, I wanted to have a 7-Eleven shoe and it didn't exist when this first started. So uh, I saw that they had the colors available on the website to make the colorway a possibility. And the Nike Dunk has a very special place in skateboarding culture. It's been highly regarded as a skateboarding shoe. It used to be a, an affordable shoe for skateboarders. So they could have a Nike that wasn't $300 and they could just tear it up and go get another. So it has something to do with the, the skateboarding culture that I was raised with. And like I said, it's about taking all of my cultural touch points that I hold dear and putting them into one project. In the video, the 7-Eleven looks so lifelike. How did you ensure that the proportions were correct to size and authenticity? At first, I made this to shoebox scale, which was uh, 
a hope and a whim that it would work out making it look real. I just started making it in the shape and size of a shoebox. Eventually you start to get into the details and you realize that you do need to start making these things to scale. And uh, I did the math and it f figured out to being about between 118 and 119 scale. And it just kind of worked out at that point. I just started to work within those numbers and everything really looked good. The entire setup of the parking lot and the building was about 10 feet wide and uh, six and a half feet tall, thereabouts. I see that the doors of the store automatically open. What electronics did you use in this project and how hard was it to install in a miniature? I used an Arduino uh, electronic controller to control the doors and then I used two micro servos to move the doors. I had 3D printed actuators to turn the servos into a linear action and it was quite complex. Uh, I did this about three different ways, failing multiple times. Uh, and these making something that's very small uh, and works in such a response or a linear fashion fashion is very difficult. The driveway was originally styrofoam, uh, the type that you would have for insulation in a home building project, coated it in liquid resin that made it hard on top so you could kind of crackle it and be, it looks kind of like asphalt already, although very glossy. From there I took uh, matte paint and I ran grey paint and black paint over top of it and then I started to uh, weather it with different uh, different opacities of acrylic paints. I added dust and I added a bunch of different uh, just texture elements to make it look like real asphalt. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for coming on the show. Your project looks beautiful and I'm so excited for what you're going to make next. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching Inbox with Julia Cosby on the International News Channel.